This video has been sponsored by Mubi, a curated film streaming and downloading service that brings you the best of independent, classic, and world cinema. Right now, viewers of 100 Years of Cinema can receive a 30-day free trial by visiting mubi.com slash 100 years. When Orson Welles was asked to name his favourite directors, he famously replied with, I prefer the old masters, by which I mean John Ford, John Ford, and John Ford. Ford's style was one of simplicity. He moved his camera sparingly, shooting only what he absolutely needed, often cutting in camera so his sequences couldn't be complicated by editors later on. He preferred the deliberate and the steady over the flashy and stylized, employing a no-nonsense economic storytelling that gave the audience everything they needed without distraction. He was natural, rugged, honest. As Wells put it, with Ford at his best, you get a sense of what the earth is made of. Some directors make films about love, some about war or humanity. Ford made films about America, and no film is more American nor more revealing of Ford's deliberate style than Stagecoach from 1939. Stagecoach is often credited with single-handedly reviving the Western after it plummeted from popularity in the early 30s. And while that's only partially true, the film has stood the test of time as one of the most influential Westerns ever made. So it begs the question, what exactly made Stagecoach so great and what can it tell us about the function and form of genre cinema? Hello and welcome to 100 Years of Cinema. We'll be taking a look at at least one film each year from 1915 onwards to track the evolution of film over the last century. Believe it or not, the Western isn't exactly an accurate reflection of life in the Wild West. For starters, in real life, violence was relatively uncommon. Quick draw duels are a work of complete fiction, and pistols were inaccurate enough to ensure that things like this never happened. Cowboys were there more to herd cows than to gun people down, and although Native American tribes did attack, it was incredibly infrequent. In fact, our image of the Wild West, the fashion, the culture, and the lifestyle largely comes from two places. Mid-19th century adventure novels like The Prairie by James Fenimore Cooper, and the immensely popular Wild West shows that toured the US and Europe from the mid-1800s. Between the two, much of the iconography of the Wild West was already established even before the invention of cinema. So whereas other genres like horror or science fiction slowly evolved their tropes over the decades, Western films emerged almost fully formed with their mythic depiction of life in the Old West. When we talk about genre, we're really talking about more than just the simple categorization of films, as genre is built from a particular visual language. As tropes and images are used again and again, they begin to take on a collective and socially accepted definition that can be used by an audience to very quickly gather information about the characters or the world. Different types of narratives, familiar themes, character types and plot points eventually become representative of different kinds of stories. By their very nature, genres are nebulous and hard to pin down. Some will last only a few years, and others will last almost forever. But they all tend to follow a similar trajectory. Tropes are established, they gain recognition, familiarity, and maybe even popularity, and by doing so, they take on new meaning. Then these tropes get overused or overly familiar, at which point they're either dropped, or if they're lucky, reinvented, and the cycle will start again and again. The history of the Western as a genre is so intertwined with the history of cinema that the very first American film that truly utilised the capabilities of the medium to tell a complex narrative, The Great Train Robbery from 1903, gave us a lot of the elements and images that we would come to associate with the Western film including train robberies, six shooters, saloons, and more. From there, the Western would go on to be the most popular genre of the silent era. From their humble beginnings at the turn of the century, as single reelers shot in dusty saloons, by the 1920s, they evolved into huge epics that spanned the American continent. Bonafide Western stars like William S. Hart became national heroes, and slowly, a new picture of the American West emerged. John Ford was one of the directors responsible for creating the huge blockbuster westerns of the silent era, helping to set the tone of the cinematic Wild West. 
one that combined historical fact with fiction and defined a cultural mythology of hard work, of a yearning for freedom, and of rugged individualism. More than just simple entertainment, these early westerns helped solidify a cultural identity for Americans. The early 1900s saw an explosion in the population of cities, and along with other factors like industrialization, a new mass consumer culture, and a perceived shift in traditional values, Americans were left yearning for a simpler time. And although the depictions of frontier life were largely fictitious, they hearkened back to a perceived real America. But as with any genre that grows popular, its tropes eventually begin to feel stale. By the late 1920s, the same things that made the genre enjoyable had become overused. An avalanche of inexpensive western B-pictures and serials had lent the genre a perceived cheapness. It's the western's ubiquity that led to its eventual decline. Finally, in 1927, the jazz singer heralded the end of the silent era and a combination of many silent cowboy stars simply being unsuitable for sound roles and the general difficulty of shooting early sound pictures outside almost killed the genre altogether. By the early 1930s, the western was considered box office poison. John Ford's last silent western came in 1926 with Three Bad Men, and it would be over 10 years until he returned to the genre with Stagecoach. Whether Stagecoach can claim full responsibility for revitalising the Western's popularity remains a contentious point. It was, after all, just one of the many big-budget Westerns that garnered critical and commercial success in the late 30s and early 40s. But what's inarguable is that Stagecoach elevated the genre to new heights. The strength of Stagecoach lies in its simplicity. The story can be boiled down to just a few sentences. Strangers board a coach to Lordsburg, travelling through the dangerous New Mexico frontier. Along the way, they fend off attack from wild Indians, and by the time they arrive at their destination, they've learnt more about each other and about themselves. But more than just the plot, it's the simplicity of Ford's light touch that is truly genius. It's the hand of a master craftsman gently guiding his actors and his camera to huge effect. Ford cuts all but the most necessary of dialogue, instead preferring to advance the plot through action. Relationships are established and explored through table settings and furtive glances. And when the characters do speak, volumes are revealed in just a few sentences. Three weeks ago, I took a bullet out of a man who was shot by a gentleman. The bullet was in his back. You mean to insinuate- Sit down, mister. Consider the rich well of information that can be mined from the opening scenes alone. Two riders as specks on the horizon mark the vastness and desolation in which our story takes place. The crossfades reveal to us the sparse pockets of civilization that will mark our journey. After a telegram is cut short when the line goes dead, the audience are left with a single word. Only the first word, sir. Geronimo. <laughs> the name of a vicious Apache warlord. And from then on, a sense of menace and threat sits over the rest of the film like a dark cloud. It's this kind of economic storytelling that elevated Stagecoach above the westerns that preceded it. Film theorist Andre Bazin described the film as the ideal example of the maturity of a style brought to classical perfection. This effect results from the film's concentration on the creation of a tight narrative unity with all of its elements serving that goal. This tight narrative unity, like all genre filmmaking, operates on shorthand. The utilisation of a collection of easily identifiable tropes and images that can instantly inform the audience and serve to push the story forward. Stagecoach borrows heavily from the tropes of B-Westerns of the silent era, but in the masterful hands of Ford, these same tropes are reborn with a new depth. With a slow zoom and the cock of a rifle, the audience can immediately recognise its hero as a rugged outlaw. But in Stagecoach, not everything is what it seems. The reason that Stagecoach was able to revive the Western so successfully was in its use of cinematic shorthand to subvert expectations. Ford used the same tropes that had been established decades ago to create new meaning, and just like that, a genre almost as old as cinema itself felt brand new. The characters that board the coach are typical archetypes from the genre, so before you even meet them, you have an idea of who we're dealing with. 
the outlaw, the prostitute, the gambler, the drunkard, the travelling salesman, the high society woman, the marshal, and the comic release driver. But unlike in earlier films, these tropes are turned on their head. After a child is born, it's the prostitute that turns out to be the best caregiver. Though the doctor is a drunkard, he comes through as the moral centre of the film. I'll take that shotgun, Luke. Whereas the pillar of the community banker transpires to be a thief. The notorious gambler is in reality the son of a high-class gentleman. If you see Judge Rainfield, tell him you son. The outlaw, Ringo Kid only ever really killed to defend his family from bandits and intended to turn himself in once their lives had been avenged. On the other hand, the hard-nosed letter of the law marshal eventually lets the Ringo Kid escape in the name of the greater good and true love. This is what great genre pictures do. They use established tropes to explore new ideas about society. In this case, a fairly typical Western plot becomes a morality story about class and gender in America. With the horrors of the First World War fresh in the minds of the audience and the Second World War just on the horizon, it's little wonder that a story about Americans from all walks of life banding together to fend off an unthinkable enemy resonated so strongly. Ford used the iconography of the American past to paint a picture of a possible American future. One where the divisions between the North and South, rich and poor, upper and lower classes could be bridged, new understandings could be forged, and by working together even the most difficult obstacles could be overcome. The depth and meaning that Ford could pull from a simple story, simple direction, and a collection of silent western cliches is absolutely incredible. It's a testament to the best that genre filmmaking can be. Ironically, many of the ideas and images that originate from Stagecoach have now themselves become cliché. But upon its release, it was revolutionary not only in its approach to the western, but to genre filmmaking as a whole. Next time you watch an old genre picture, think about the tropes being used. How often have you seen them before, and what are they trying to say about the time that the film was being made? And if you were to make a film using the same tropes today, how would you use them differently? Because if you can take tired, worn out, and overused tropes, and use them to tell us something new, and interesting, and daring, maybe you can make a film as great as Stagecoach. Hey, thanks for watching, my name's Charlie. I want to say a special thank you to everyone that supports me on Patreon, particularly my latest supporters, XR Sft, Jasmine Cam, and Joey DeAngelis. I also want to thank Mubi for sponsoring this video. Mubi is a curated film streaming service. Each month, there are 30 new films to watch, with a new film featured every day. There are cult classics, award-winning masterpieces, forgotten gems, and brand new independent releases. Right now, fans of classic cinema can watch a film that I've talked about a little on this channel, Berlin, Symphony of a Great City, a really interesting experimental film from the 1920s. But remember, Mubi only hosts each film for 30 days, and when it's gone, it's gone. So head over right now to mubi.com slash 100 years to start a 30-day trial to get access to that and a great selection of other films. They need me in this Winchester, Curly. Saw a ranch house burning last night. <laughs>